Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're dealing with a few issues that keep popping up age after age through reflection and examination of the scriptures. This time, what does the Bible say about our environment? The environment in which we live, at least in this life, is a small planet orbiting a decent-sized star in a single galaxy out of billions. That planet is called Earth. To understand the proper perspective from which we should view our environment, therefore, we need to understand what role the Earth has in the created world, and fortunately the Bible addresses this. The Earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and all they that dwell therein. Psalm 23 or 24, 1b. The first thing to keep in mind when studying our environment is who it belongs to. Our environment does not belong to us, or our children, or the poor, or the rich, or landowners, or anyone else. It belongs to Almighty God first and foremost. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Genesis 1, 1. The reason why the earth belongs to God is because it was God who created it out of nothing. No one else can claim such a strong reason for ownership of anything. And he began to speak to the people in this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, and let it out to husbandmen, and he was abroad for a long time. Luke 20, 9 Just because God owns the earth, however, doesn't mean we're not allowed to use its resources, in the same way that vineyard tenants are allowed to use the vineyard to grow fruit, even though they don't technically own the property. And the Lord God took man, and put him into the paradise of pleasure to dress it and to keep it. Genesis two fifteen. Our role should be to care for the creations of God which he places into our control, and in exchange, we can derive pleasure from the good things that God gives us. The amount of pleasure that we derive from our property isn't as great as it was in the Garden of Eden, but that's because of sin. And I brought, and I brought you, you into, into the, the land, land of Carmel, Carmel to eat the fruit thereof, and the and best things thereof, and, thereof. and when, when you entered it, it you, defiled you defiled my land, and made, made my, my inheritance, inheritance an abomination. abomination. Jeremiah 2 7. When people use the land given to them by God for sin and evil, rather than for honest work, freedom, and clean happiness, they're not being responsible or faithful with what they've been given. We should use our land and the plants and other life in it faithfully and justly, doing our best to avoid sin and evil and do good. There are many verses that refer to sin as tarnishing the land in this way. That leaves the topic of animals, and on that topic there's a careful balance that needs to be maintained. Thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. Exodus 20, 4-5a This doesn't mean we're forbidden to make images of animals, because... And the Lord said to him, Make a brazen serpent, and set it up for a sign. Whosoever being struck shall look on it, shall live. Numbers 21, 8. But it does mean that we are not under any circumstances to worship animals or treat them like our masters. If there is any question about whose life is more important, the answer is never the life of the animal. However, many animals are kept by people, both domesticated and livestock. The just regardeth the lives of his beasts, but the bowels of the wicked are cruel. Proverbs 12:10. Nevertheless, we shouldn't treat the lives of animals under our care as if they had no value. We should definitely care for them rather than expressing our cruel feelings against them. Remember, bowels in Old Hebrew refers to the location where they thought the feelings were. This verse is describing people with cruel emotions. So we should care for our animals, treating them well, but never placing them into a higher priority than ourselves or our fellow human beings. Finally, there are many people who treat our environment as though it were a god as though the preservation of our environment was a life-or-death matter, and for the sake of everyone we had to protect it, no matter what that entailed. According to the Bible, however, this is not the way to go. But the day of the Lord shall come as a thief, in which the heavens shall pass away with great violence, and the elements shall be melted with heat, and the earth and the works which are in it shall be burnt up. Seeing, then, that all these things are to be dissolved, what manner of people ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? 2 Peter 
3, 10 to 11. The earth, as we now know it, will not last. It will inevitably be burnt up and melted, and a new heaven and a new earth will take its place, free from sin and wickedness. That earth will last forever, but the one we're currently living in won't. Because of this, while we have certain obligations in terms of how we treat our environments, God doesn't expect us to protect and preserve them forever. He will preserve us through his miraculous power in a way that no world ever could. Next, what does the Bible have to say about prejudice? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.